Hey everybody, and welcome back for another bone-crushing, face-smashing edition of Show Rebuke, and where today we are taking a look at what is definitely one of the best beat-em-ups I've played in a long time, and that is Final Vendetta for the Nintendo Switch, and between this, Streets of Rage 4, and Shredder's Revenge, I have been absolutely flush with brawlers, taking out all of my frustrations on the faces of countless anonymous henchmen. After all, it's the next best thing to beating up people in real life, which I would obviously never do, unless, of course, it's true that video games cause violence, in which case, watch out, world, because I've played a hell of a lot of video games. Anyway, Final Vendetta, let's dig a little deeper into this game and find out what exactly makes it so badass. The first thing you'll notice when you boot up Final Vendetta is that visually and aesthetically, this is obviously an homage to the classic beat-em-ups of the 90s, and it was made with a lot of care. You'll of course be reminded of Streets of Rage, but there are also influences from the Final Fight series, and I even picked up a bit of Burning Fight, an often overlooked Neo Geo classic. Everything from the character designs, and stage backgrounds to something as simple as the fonts used just screams early 90s beat-em-up and it's done about as well as those classics were even better in many instances this is a great looking game with a lot of personality and better yet the soundtrack is amazing the ways from the underground. Bitmap Bureau could have gone with a 16-bit styled sound to match the visuals, but instead made the choice wisely, in my opinion, to go with a proper 90s hip-hop and techno dance-inspired soundtrack, and every track, whether it be the title screen, the stage tracks, or the boss theme, the music in Final Vendetta is fantastic, and when coupled with the visuals, makes this one of the better looking and sounding retro inspired games I've ever played. So we've established that the visuals and soundtrack for Final Vendetta are awesome, but that will only take you so far if the gameplay isn't any good. And in this case, I can safely say that this is indeed one of the best playing beat em ups I've ever played. I was actually shocked at just how smooth the controls were, how much variety there was in the movesets of each character, and how extremely satisfying it felt to beat the bad guys to a bloody pulp, because that's the operating word with any good beat-em-up. Satisfying. You have to feel like you're really letting those filthy criminals have it when you knock their heads in with a lead pipe. You have three playable characters to choose from, and they follow the basic tropes of any good beat-em-up. There's the hot young woman with a lot of speed and a short skirt reminiscent of Blaze from Streets of Rage. There's a big bruiser character who moves slower than everybody else, but also has a lot of power and some sweet pro wrestling moves. And then you've got your middleman who has a nice balance of speed and power and some pretty sweet combos. Basically, the Cody or Axel of this game. Come on then. Each character is different, but they are all a lot of fun to play as, and this game gives you a wide variety of attacks and special moves to play around with. For starters, you have your basics like a standard combo, jumping attack, and throws that you'd expect to find in any beat-em-up, and of course, you can perform a special spinning attack that sacrifices a little bit of health, but a cool addition here is your special meter that allows you to pull off this attack without losing any health when it's full. In addition to that, you also have a block button, which is pretty nifty. It allows you to block 
most attacks, but I tend to play this type of game very aggressively, so I honestly forgot it was even there for most of the game. You can also perform a dash attack, which comes in handy, and something I love in this game is that you can attack downed opponents, which I really wanted to do in a lot of other beat-em-ups, and it's especially fun to do with Miller, the big bruiser character, who can perform a diving elbow drop that even the Macho Man would be proud of, and then stomp the bad guy into the ground. Again, satisfying. <laughs> One more thing that really kicks the gameplay up a notch in Final Vendetta is the addition of a dedicated special button that when combined with other button presses allows you to execute some pretty sweet moves at the cost of a little bit of your special meter and this includes special combos, flying attacks, and special throws too such as Miller's devastating torture rack backbreaker. Man this guy has it all! Awesome moves, pro wrestling persona, and a mullet that refuses to quit. So all of those different play mechanics come together in a big, bad way to make one amazing playing beat-em-up that even gives Streets of Rage 4 a run for its money, with the only drawback being that it's a pretty short game. I would have loved a few more stages to play around with, but you can unlock additional modes like Boss Rush and Survival to get a little more playtime in. And of course, this is also a two-player game, so grab a friend and bust some heads with fantastic visuals, an outstanding soundtrack, and gameplay that'll remind you of why you loved beat-em-ups in the first place, Final Vendetta is a must-play game for any fan of the genre. It's retro, it's brutal, and it's awesome. awesome. Hey everybody, welcome back for another shooting edition of Show Reviewkin, where today we are taking a look at yet another indie shooter on the Nintendo Switch that tries to emulate some of the classics in the genre while also doing something unique, and that is Soft Star. This game was developed by a small indie dev called Banana Bites and released on Steam in August of 2022 but was picked up and published by Red Art Games for a release on consoles, both digital and physical, and they were kindly enough to provide us with a review code, so thank you very much for that. Anyway, Soft Star, an indie shooter that seeks to set itself apart in a sea of shoot-'em-ups being released these days, so let's take a closer look and find out if it is successful in this task or if you're better off just sticking with some of the more popular titles in the genre. On the surface, Soft Star looks kind of unremarkable. It looks like a million other shoot 'em ups you've played before, and for the most part, it is. Nothing about Soft Star really blew me away on my initial boot up. It wasn't until I spent a little time with it that I started to appreciate some of the cooler features in Soft Star. For starters, there is a wide variety of playable ships, nine in total, and each one plays uniquely from the others. They vary in speed the type of shot they use, and a different special weapon that ranges from a traditional super bomb, a laser shot, or some kind of defensive ability. With so many ships, it kind of reminds me of the Raiden Fighters series, and it is nice to have a little variety, but at the same time, some of the ships seem kind of superfluous. After trying them all out, I really only felt like three or four of them were really essential. 
The core gameplay itself is pretty solid, and if you're playing the arcade mode, you are given a lot of different difficulty settings to choose from, and even on the normal setting, Softstar does get pretty tough after the first couple of stages, and you do have a limited supply of continues, but you can earn more with repeat playthroughs of the arcade mode. Regardless of what ship you're using, you'll have three different abilities to make use of. There's your primary fire, be that a spread shot, homing shot, whatever the case may be, and your special ability, which as mentioned before, can be anything from a super bomb to a defensive ability that negates all bullets and is limited to the energy in your special meter, which can be refilled with power-ups. Aside from that is one more ability that spices up the gameplay in Softstar, and that is your teleport ability. That's right, you can teleport around the screen, which as you might imagine, is very useful in a shooter like this, and it is a very cool ability, but not quite perfected. Again, this ability is different for each ship, and they're not all created equal. Some of the ships allow you to teleport in whatever direction you want, but for example, one of the ships teleports to a random location on the screen, which seems to defeat the purpose of it. Another ship opens up a black hole that sucks in enemies and bullets instead of teleporting, which is nifty, but not quite as fun as zipping around the screen, and those that do teleport, the distance and time taken varies, so it'll take you some time to find the ship that's right for you, that has your preferred balance of firepower and a teleportability that you can actually make good use of. All things considered though, once you find the ship that you like, the gameplay in Softstar is challenging and fun, and there's a variety of gameplay modes including time challenge, score attack, a cadet school that gives you various challenges to complete, and an endless mode that, unlike the name implies actually does end when you die. So the gameplay here is quite solid and enjoyable and you've got a lot of modes and options to keep you busy. The visuals and sound design in Softstar are kind of a mixed bag for me. While I do greatly appreciate the retro stylings of a game like this, some of the stages admittedly do look a little bit bland, while others are quite elaborate. Again, a mixed bag, but overall I do like the look of Softstar, but just like Hellblasters, another indie shooter I reviewed recently, I really didn't care about the story or characters presented in the arcade mode, and honestly felt that the story segments just interrupted the flow of gameplay, but you can turn these off, in the options menu. Call me old fashioned, but when it comes to shooters, all I really need is an opening text crawl. As for the sound design, I honestly found the soundtrack to be pretty underwhelming. It's not bad, mind you, but compared to the music in some of the other games I've been reviewing recently, the soundtrack here just sounded kinda bland and forgettable, but the sound effects were on point, including some powerful explosions and a very enthusiastic announcer when you pick up power-ups. So overall, while not the best looking or sounding shooter on the Switch, Softstar is definitely a solid playing game that I can recommend to shooter fans, especially considering that it is an inexpensive game if you decide to go with a digital download. Indeed, if you feel like you've played every shooter out there and you just can't get enough of that fast twitch, bullet dodging, super bombing action, that's exactly what Soft Star is here for. Quite well, in the old style, but you've caused me enough trouble, now you face the Shredder. It 
It only took 30 years, but we finally got a beat em up that's even better than the longtime king of the genre, which is, of course, Turtles in Time, be that the arcade original or the SNES port, but indeed, the king has been dethroned, and the new best beat em up ever is TMNT Shredder's Revenge. That's right, in a strange twist, the turtles have been outdone by themselves. I guess it's true what they say, it takes a turtle to beat a turtle. Or at least I think that's a saying. I may have made that up in a drunken stupor, but regardless, it rings true. The old best beat em up and the new best beat em up are indeed 100% turtles, and I couldn't be happier about that. It's so great to return to these characters and rediscover why I loved them and this style of gameplay to begin with, so you probably don't need me to tell you, but let's take a closer look at Shredder's Revenge and see just what makes this such an awesome game. The most important element of any beat-em-up, any video game really, is obviously going to be the gameplay and what you get in Shredder's Revenge is, in my opinion, pretty much flawless pick-up-and-play beat-em-up style gameplay and it's a game that throws in some pretty cool little bonuses as well. The gameplay here is obviously very much inspired by its TMNT predecessors, in particular Turtles in Time including similar stage intros and even the ability to launch foot soldiers into the screen. And just like those previous games, beating up hordes of bad guys is extremely satisfying, and this time around you've got a lot more abilities at your disposal. <laughs> oh man, I just fixed the party wagon! Shredder's Revenge gives each character their own unique launch attack, various aerial attacks, dash attacks, and a series of super attacks that can clear a screen of enemies and deal some serious damage to bosses, and these attacks are different for each of the game's seven playable characters, as are their taunts, a cool new ability that, if executed without getting hit, mind you, nets you a free super attack gauge. Not only is there a wider variety of attacks in Shredder's Revenge, but there's also way more stages to play through than any of the previous Turtles games, multiple difficulty settings, and you can choose between a straightforward arcade mode, which is obviously very fun in its own right and challenges you to finish the game without having any continues, or better yet, there is a very cool story mode that has you navigating the Turtle Van around New York City in a very Super Mario 3 type format where you'll be tasked with finding hidden characters and items as well as completing various challenges that will earn you the points needed to level up your characters giving them more health, more super combo gauges and access to even more super attacks. I am the Rat King, you're trespassing on royal ground. Dude, you wear two bandanas? So there's a lot more depth to the gameplay here than in previous Turtles games, and that's not even mentioning the multiplayer, which allows for up to six players simultaneously, which is absolutely insane when you've got six characters on screen all at once, beating the hell out of an endless stream of foot soldiers, pulling off super attacks, leaping all around the screen, things can get extremely frantic, and it's insanely fun. This is seriously the most fun I've ever had playing a beat em up, and that covers a lot of ground because I've pretty much played them all. Final Fight, Double Dragon, Streets of Rage, and yes, even Turtles in Time. This game sits atop all of them as the most fun beat em up I've ever played. But wait, there's more. Final Fashion Time! We're gonna stomp you, wimps! In a game like this, which is to say a new game that seeks to recapture the magic of a nostalgic license and please a dedicated fan base, the aesthetics are just as important as the gameplay, if I'm being completely honest. 
and Shredder's Revenge is the best possible game we could have gotten in that regard. For starters, the visuals are done in a fantastic retro-inspired 2D style, which was a great choice because there have been 3D Turtles games before and they pretty much always suck. Here we get a wide variety of very detailed and colorful stages set all around New York City and Dimension X and we don't have to lose the feel of the classic Turtles beat-em-ups. And speaking of classic, the designs of all of the characters are in keeping with the original TMNT animated series, which is awesome and wow do we get a lot of characters, both playable and in the form of a ton of boss characters. This game is seriously like an old school advertisement for the TMNT toy line, which put a big ol' smile on my face. <laughs> you don't be a skinhead, come on, man. So with amazing gameplay and a visual style that is perfect for this type of game, the last remaining component is the sound design and again, Shredder's Revenge absolutely crushes it in this department. As a childhood fan of the animated series, I was very happy to hear the voices of a lot of the returning cast from the original show. It was a great shot of nostalgia as far as the soundtrack is concerned. I'll just say that the soundtrack for Turtles in Time is one of my all-time favorites, but Shredder's Revenge is again on another level entirely. Every stage features a track that is complementary to the stage itself, obviously, but is also extremely listenable on its own. You'll mostly be hearing what can best be described as kind of an upbeat synth style of music, which is great for keeping up the energy while you bust some heads. But in addition to that, there are also some amazing rock and hip hop tracks featuring some artists that I was really surprised and very happy to hear. And that includes a newly recorded Turtles theme song featuring vocals by Faith No More's Mike Patton, a track composed and performed by Johnny Atma who I know best from his YouTube channel where he provides metal covers of classic video game music and an awesome track by Wu-Tang Clan's Raekwon and Ghostface Killer, which again is all the motivation you need to kick some serious ass. Honestly, this is now one of my favorite soundtracks from any video game. It's an instant classic. I just spent my time in this review telling you a bunch of stuff I'm sure you already knew. I told you that Shredder's Revenge features some amazing visuals and great sound design, and it's the most fun you'll ever have playing a beat em up. But here's something you didn't know. A teaspoon full of material from the sun would, on average, weigh about a quarter of an ounce. Which is very surprising because I thought it would weigh a lot more than that. Anyway, if you're a beat em up fan and you haven't played Shredder's Revenge yet, you need to drop everything and get yourself a copy because it is now the best beat em up ever made. And that, my friends, isn't just righteous, it isn't just excellent. Not even just Bossa Nova. That is what I like to call awesome. We were awesome! Bodacious! Yeah. <laughs> Good shit! Yeah. Uh... Gnarly! <laughs> radical! Yeah! <laughs> totally uh, toothless, dude! Uh, 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 wicked! Oh, hell delicious! <laughs> Kawabunga! Hmm? Huh? Hey, you got your ninjas in my Terminator. You got your Terminator in my ninjas. Wait a minute. This is unexpectedly awesome. Or actually, it's expectedly awesome because, you know, it's ninjas 
and Terminators all rolled into one because today we're taking a look at a game that features Ninja Terminators. But it's not called Ninja Terminator for some reason. No, no, it's called Ninja Saviors Return of the Warriors. And it's a game that I had almost too much fun with. Even though it really kicked my ass at first, this game is no walk in the park. But you will be doing a lot of walking, but we'll get to that. For now, though, just know that this is an excellent game, especially if you're a fan of the first couple of Ninja Warriors games or old-school brawlers in general. This is a game you'll definitely want to play if you haven't already. So let's go in for a closer look and see what makes Ninja Savior so damn cool. Even though a game featuring Ninja Terminators pretty much sells itself. In case you missed it, in 1994, Taito released a game called The Ninja Warriors Again, which was developed by Natsume, and it was pretty cool. You had three robotic ninjas to choose from on a mission to bring down an evil corporate overlord in a dystopian future. It was very simple and fun, a side-scrolling beat-em-up that featured some nice visuals and sound design. A solid title overall, so it makes sense that when it was decided to make a new Ninja Warriors for modern consoles, they went with a remake of Ninja Warriors again. This game features the same story, the same stages and enemies, and the same basic gameplay but obviously everything has been upgraded without losing the feel of a classic 16-bit beat-em-up. You get the same three returning ninjas to play as, and something especially nice here is that their movesets have been expanded to include some pretty cool techniques that allow you to perform more combos and get around the screen a bit faster, which is very nifty because also, just like the previous games, you cannot dash in Ninja Saviors, you are restricted to walking only. So it really does come in handy when, for example, you can flip around as the Kunoichi or use the Ninja's Jet Boosters to increase your movement speed. In addition to the three initially playable characters, you can unlock two new characters by beating the game on the normal and hard difficulty settings for a total of five playable characters, and I'm happy to say that they are all unique and fun to play as. No cannon fodder here, but unlocking those extra characters is definitely easier said than done because Ninja Saviors can be a pretty tough playthrough, or at least until you get a good grasp of the controls and learn the best ways to take down the game's various enemies and bosses and get around some of those very pesky stage hazards. And even then, it's still kind of tricky. These things might be Terminators and all, but they are prone to exploding if they get punched or stabbed enough, which seems like something they should have taken care of at the factory. Overall, though, very fun gameplay and some pretty cool unlockables, too. On top of the bonus characters, you can unlock a time attack mode, for every stage in the game, and even the soundtrack for the original Ninja Warriors game, which is excellent. Oh, and on top of all of that, if you have a Ninja buddy to hang out with, you can enjoy some co-op gameplay. On top of that, like I said earlier, Ninja Savior still has the look and feel of its 16-bit counterpart, but it's a much more detailed and colorful game, and the original soundtrack, which was really good in its own right, has also been updated and sounds even better than it did in 1994. So it's all positives. This game takes everything that I loved about Ninja Warriors again and improves it in every way possible. It's actually one of my favorite modern 
retro reboots and that covers a lot of ground these days so again if you love ninjas and you love terminator i implore you to play this game as soon as possible because it's the peanut butter cup of video games it's ninja saviors return of the warriors and it's awesome awesome Hey everybody, welcome back for another modern slash retro sort of review, just like with Ninja Saviors, we're taking a look at a game that was an SNES classic by Natsume, that has been revamped and recharged for modern consoles, and that's Kiki Kaikai, Kuromanto no Nazo, aka Pocky and Rocky Reshrined. Yes, this is indeed a quasi-remake of the original 1992 Pocky and Rocky that itself was sort of a remake slash kind of sequel to the original Kiki Kai Kai arcade game that was released way back in 1986, though this doesn't really feel like an exact remake because it makes enough changes that it really is its own unique game, even if the Japanese version does share the same name as its Super Famicom counterparts, and it's equal parts fun and brutal. You'll be smiling one minute and hurling obscenities the next, but we'll get into all that for now, though. Just know that this game is awesome, even if it did make me want to pull my hair out a time or two. So let's take a closer look and see why this is possibly the best of any of the modern retro games that I've ever played. For starters, ReShrine takes the same basic gameplay of the SNES game and adds some cool features to make it better without losing what made it fun to begin with, kind of like they did with Wild Guns Reloaded and again Ninja Saviors. Both Pocky and Rocky are playable in the single player and co-op modes and they both make use of a variety of weapons that can be obtained through power-ups, though now the weapons are unique to each character. So for example, while Sayo, aka Pocky's basic shot, is a straightforward and powerful spread shot, while Manuke, aka Rocky, starts out with a homing shot, and each weapon they pick up after that will behave differently depending on who you're playing as. <laughs> They both also have a very nifty slide ability to get them out of harm's way, as well as a limited number of super attacks, which really come in handy when you need to clear the screen or deal some big damage to bosses. And perhaps most useful of all, they both have a swiping attack that can deflect enemy projectiles and even send them flying back at enemies for some extra damage. All of these weapons and abilities are cool, but they're really just the tip of the iceberg as playing through the story mode you'll unlock new abilities for them not featured in the SNES game and you'll even unlock several new playable characters and they have a bunch of unique abilities of their own so there's plenty of variety to the gameplay and again you can tackle this game solo or with a second player which is just as fun now as it was in 1992. I did mention before though that this game is brutally difficult, and I stand by that claim. During my first playthrough I was dying a lot, and figured out very quickly that you need to learn the enemy patterns in each stage, 
and what the best tool for the job is for each segment before you can progress and even then it's still pretty tricky and you don't even have an easy mode to fall back on at first as you actually have to unlock it by earning coins in the story mode be that as it may this is still a very fun game and once you do finally get the hang of all your abilities and start to understand the enemy patterns a little better this game goes from being brutally difficult to merely very challenging at least on the normal difficulty anyway On top of its solid gameplay, this is both a great looking and great sounding game. Again, just like with the other recent Natsume remakes, ReShrine takes the same look and aesthetics of the original game, but really beefs it up to give us some absolutely stunning sprite work that really impressed me. The stages are very detailed, the characters look great, especially the boss characters that tend to be very large and take up about half the screen and thank goodness for that because it allows you to marvel at how awesome they look even simple things like the menus and the overworld for the story mode feature a lot of attention to detail and on the whole i'd say this is probably the best looking game so far that natsume has remade <laughs> Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fantastic soundtrack that is at the same time fun and poppy, but maintains a distinctly Japanese sound to match the visuals and the plot, which is steeped in traditional Japanese Shinto lore and imagery. Indeed, this is a game that has it all. Beautiful graphics and sound and gameplay that is every bit as good as it is challenging, which again has me pondering with all of the recent retro-inspired games and remakes of classic titles on modern consoles. Is this the best of the bunch? I don't know, but my gut says maybe. Whatever the case may be, if you haven't already, go out of your way to play Pocky and Rocky Reshrined, because it is awesome. Awesome! Hey everybody, and welcome back for another retro edition of Show Rebukin, with a game that I've had a lot of fun with recently, and that's Clockwork Aquario. Though it's only a quasi-retro review, really, because this game was actually released at the tail end of 2021, and I'm just late to the party on this one as usual, but it was originally developed about 30 years ago and shelved when it was almost complete because it sort of flopped with arcade gamers when it was tested, presumably because everyone was busy with Street Fighter and Fatal Fury. Well, I guess someone thought better of it and put the finishing touches on this bad boy and released it for all of us to enjoy better late than never, as they say. So let's take a closer look at Clockwork Aquario and find out what those tasteless test audiences torpedoed some three decades ago. When you first look at Clockwork Aquario, you'll immediately notice two things. One is that this is an insanely bright and colorful game, one of the most vibrant games I've ever played in fact, which makes sense if it was originally meant to grab the attention of passing arcade players. And the other thing you might notice is that these character designs look very familiar. That's because it was originally designed 
by Ryuichi Nishizawa and the team at West Stone, the same developer as the Wonder Boy series, so their art style is all over this game, and I must say, it's absolutely beautiful. I love the character designs, the enemies, the stages and boss designs, it all looks amazing, and it's kind of sad that games that look like this don't get much distribution these days, but at the very least, it's great that we can play this game and marvel at this amazing artwork. And before we move on to the gameplay, I'll just add that the sound design is also fantastic with an extremely catchy soundtrack that I've actually enjoyed outside of the game and the sound effects and what little voice work there is are also really good. Now, about that gameplay. The gameplay in Clockwork Aquario, as you might expect, with this being an arcade game and all, is very straightforward and simple. In essence, it's an action platformer that tasks you with defeating enemies, collecting power-ups, and popping balloons. You have two methods for dispatching enemies. You can either slap them or jump on top of them, and when they're stunned, you can pick them up and lob them at other enemies. And the more enemies and balloons you can destroy in rapid succession, the more bonus points you can rack up. You can only sustain two hits before you die, but by picking up a red potion, you can restore your health. Otherwise, it can be used as a weapon to throw at enemies. Also, you only have three lives per credit, but by picking up the different colored gems that some enemies and balloons drop, you can earn extra lives as indicated by the one-up counter next to your character portrait, and at the end of each stage is a boss battle, and these are honestly the trickiest parts of the game, but after a few attempts, the patterns are pretty easy to learn, and if you're lucky enough to get the almighty star power-up, you can make short work of any of the game's bosses, and eventually, I was able to breeze through a single-player playthrough in about 25 minutes. Of course, you can also play through this game co-op style, which is really fun, and opens up a bonus stage that is strictly for two players only. Even though this game is short and not particularly challenging, it is really fun while it lasts, and you can play for high scores if you really want to. Initially have easy, medium, and hard difficulty modes to choose from, and the only real difference is the number of continues you have, and after you beat one of those modes, you unlock the proper arcade mode where you have as many continues as you want. Aside from that, you can play the bonus game from the start menu, and there's also a gallery mode included, which gives you some very nice production art to look at and a little bit of background about the game itself. And that's about it. All things considered, this is a fairly easy and short but very fun arcade game with some really great visuals and sound. And even though it's a Japan exclusive release, it comes with a bunch of different language options so that more people can enjoy it more easily. So, if you're a fan of old school games by West Stone or just arcade platformers in general, I'd highly recommend giving this quirky little game a try. It's Clockwork Aquario, and it's awesome. Hey everybody, welcome back for another kick-ass episode of Show Review Can, where today we're throwing on some Oakleys, 
styling our mullets and or mustaches and we're hitting the beach to toss a disc around because today we are taking a look at Wind Jammers 2, a sequel that only took 30 years to come out and it was brought to us by .emu who have released a ton of quote unquote modern retro games as of late such as TMNT, Shredder's Revenge, and Streets of Rage 4, so with a track record like that you'd think Windjammers 2 would be absolutely awesome. And you'd be right, I was a big fan of the original Windjammers, aka Flying Power Disc, ever since the first time I played it on Neo Geo CD. So when I heard there was a sequel released in 2022, I dropped everything, and I do mean everything, pants included, and bought myself a copy. So let's go in for a closer look and see if this game is as good as the Neo Geo original, or is it even better? If you've never played Windjammers before, it can best be described as kind of an updated version of Pong. Just replace the little square with a frisbee, and replace the other little squares with two people on either end of the court, and there you go, it's Windjammers. That's the simple explanation, but obviously there's a little more to it than that. In Windjammers 2, you have 10 selectable characters to choose from, and they all have varying levels of speed and strength. Basically, there are characters with faster movement speed and characters with faster throwing speed, and there are a couple of balanced characters as well. There are also a bunch of different courts to play on, and they too contain different elements that alter the gameplay a bit. So, for example, the layouts of the goals might be different, changing the location of the 3 and 5 point zones, or they might have bumpers in the middle of the court that can send the disc flying in a direction you didn't anticipate, or my personal favorite, a casino court where the point values change every time someone scores a goal. These fun little court gimmicks combine with this colorful cast of characters who all play a little differently from each other, including each character having different special shots that can either be fast and powerful, or move in a tricky pattern, throw in some fun mini games and online competitive play, and what we get is definitely way better than Pong. In fact, it's even better than the original Windjammers, which I thought was a pretty tall order, but I was pleasantly surprised, and I haven't even mentioned the visuals and sound design yet. Looking at this game, you can see that it was obviously given the same graphical treatment as Streets of Rage 4, and while honestly I feel like this visual style was hit or miss in that game, sometimes looking really good and other times making me miss the classic 16-bit visual style, here I think it looks great. Honestly, part of that is because the original game wasn't really very graphically impressive, the visuals and characters were not especially memorable, the draw was the addictive and fun gameplay. Here though, the visuals are very bright and colorful, each of the characters has a lot more personality and individual quirks than before, and a lot of care has been taken with the stage designs, the detail and animation, and overall presentation. On top of that, the soundtrack has been given an overhaul too, and has a very bright, energetic, and upbeat sound that perfectly matches the colorful visuals the fast action gameplay, and the quasi-retro stylings that this game is going for. So I say again, in every way possible, visuals, sound, and gameplay, this is an improvement over the original Windjammers, which was already a great game in its own right, and I recommend this game to pretty much anyone. It's easy to get the hang of, it's competitive, and it's extremely fun. It's Windjammers 2! And it's all kinds of awesome.
Hey everybody, welcome back for another Bullet Hell edition of Show Reviewkin, and we've got something really special on offer today, and that is Akai Katana Shin for the shoot 'em up machine that I like to call my Nintendo Switch, which is especially cool because I used to play this game all the time on my previous shoot 'em up machine, which was the Xbox 360. And good news, if you enjoyed this game on the 360 as much as I did, then you're in luck because it is basically a straight port of the 360 version put out by City Connection, who don't have the greatest track record in the world, but they did do a decent job porting over the Death Smiles games to the Switch, so let's take a closer look and see if they did an equally good job here, or if you should dust off that old 360 if you want to give Akai Katana another go. First, I'll just answer the biggest question. Is this a decent playing port of Akai Katana? And to that I say yes, again, it's just a straight port of the Xbox 360 release, so it features the same gameplay modes and options that version did, and from what I can tell, keeping in mind that I'm not the type that counts frames or anything like that, the gameplay is smooth and responsive. If there is any input lag, it's minimal because I didn't really seem to notice it. The game controls and plays fine. Now, with that being said, the only remaining question for gamers who haven't played Akai Katana yet is, is this game worth playing in a sea of shoot 'em ups being released on the Switch? And again, to that I say a resounding yes. Akai Katana Shin. I've been a big fan of cave shooters for over a decade now, and Akai Katana has long been one of my favorites, along with games like Death Smiles and Dodon Pachi, and this release features not one, not two, but three different variations of Akai Katana to enjoy. For starters, we get the original arcade version from 2010, and if you've never played it before, this is a very fun bullet hell shooter with a kind of tricky scoring system. You have three different ships to choose from that each play a little differently, and as you destroy enemies, you collect green energy power-ups to fill up your power meter next to your health, and this green energy allows you to transform into your ninja mode, and while in this mode, you are totally invincible as long as you're either not firing your weapons or firing your rapid shot. The bullets will just sort of bounce off of you, and when you destroy enemies with your power shot, you can cancel out their bullets, and when you exit your ninja mode, you repel any surrounding bullets away from you. It's also while in your ninja mode that you can accumulate lots of score bonuses, and the less health you have, the more energy you're able to store up, so essentially, you blow up a legion of enemies while dodging tons of bullets, build up your power meter, transform into your ninja mode, and rack up all the points you can. It's fun, challenging, and addictive, and there's an arranged mode included here called Zetsu Akai Katana, which keeps the same gameplay mechanics as the arcade original, but makes a few tweaks as well. Both of these modes are great, of course, but for me, the best way to play this one is the titular Akai Katana Shin mode. Akai Katana Shin is also known as Slash Mode, and it totally retools the gameplay and the scoring system. You have the same playable ships, the controls function the same, and the stages and bosses are the same as well, but the alterations made, for me, make this a much more fun way to play Akai Katana. In this mode, destroying enemies with your rapid shot earns you blue power-ups referred to as Steel and destroying enemies with your power shot gets you the green energy needed to fill your power meter the same as before, and when you transform into your ninja mode and when you come out of your ninja mode, you launch giant katana swords across the screen, 
canceling out bullets, dealing massive damage to everything they touch, and earning you a ridiculous amount of bonus points. Seriously, the world record is somewhere in the billions. It's insane, and it's very satisfying when you have a full stock of steel launching your katana attack at the exact right time and watching those points roll in like a slot machine. On top of that, unlike the other two gameplay modes, here you can take multiple hits while in your ninja form as long as you have enough energy. So store up that steel, build up that power meter, and then watch those points go through the roof. Akai Katana is an insanely fun game, regardless of which mode you're playing, but Shin Mode is definitely my favorite, and if you're at all familiar with cave shooters, you know they always feature nice visuals and awesome sound design, and Akai Katana is no exception. Great, colorful, highly detailed 2D backgrounds, and a high-energy, rocking soundtrack that makes blowing up countless enemies just that much more satisfying. Honestly, there are a ton of great bullet hell shooters available for the Switch right now, but for me, Cave are still the kings of the genre, and Akai Katana is one of my favorite Cave shooters, and it's ported beautifully here. If you're a shooter fan with a growing Switch collection, this is a must play. It's Akai Katana Shin, and it's awesome. <laughs> everybody, welcome back for another shooting edition of Show Reviewkin, and today we're taking a look at what just might be the best shoot 'em up available for the Nintendo Switch right now, and that is Rolling Gunner plus Overpower, which as the name implies, includes both the original Rolling Gunner, an amazing game in its own right, and the updated Rolling Gunner Overpower, which, if you ask me, is even better than the original, which I thought was a pretty tall order. I was already a fan of Rolling Gunner after playing it at an arcade in Akihabara, but Overpower just blew me away with its sheer awesomeness. So let's get down to brass tacks and see why this is a must-own game if you are indeed a shooter fan. <laughs> For starters, we have the original Rolling Gunner, which, if you've never played it, is a fantastic shooter. The premise is very simple. It's a straightforward, side-scrolling bullet hell shooter, and the main gimmick to the gameplay is the titular Rolling Gun, a pod that follows your ship's movements and can fire in all directions. It can also be locked into place to focus your fire to a specific section of the screen, or you can use it for a powerful focus shot that slows down your movement speed while increasing your attack power. You also have a power meter at the bottom left of the screen that fills up as you collect medals from destroyed enemies. And when it reaches 1000, you can enter a powered up mode that further increases your attack power and increases your point bonuses, but while in this mode, you build up a second power meter, which then allows you to activate another, even more powerful mode where your attack power and point bonuses go through the roof for a limited amount of time. And of course, what shooter would be complete without a supply of super bombs that annihilate everything on screen? Thank you. 
Indeed, when it comes to pure firepower, Rolling Gunner has got you covered. And on top of that, the controls are super smooth, the gameplay is challenging and extremely fun, and you get some excellent retro-inspired visuals and an awesome soundtrack to boot. This is legit one of my favorite shooters to be published in the past 10 years or so, and it's only half of the package here. If you can believe it, this game gets even better when you jump over to Rolling Gunner Overpower. Rolling Gunner Overpower is not an entirely new game, but instead is more of an update. And the changes made were definitely for the better because, in my opinion, Overpower overshadows the original game in almost every way. In fact, the only thing that hasn't had a total overhaul is the visuals. It still looks the exact same as vanilla Rolling Gunner, and you also get the same number of stages, and the enemies haven't changed either. In terms of controls though, something very cool about Overpower is that it plays as more of a twin stick shooter with one thumbstick controlling the ship's movement and the other controlling the position of the rolling gun. And this gives the gameplay a much greater sense of smoothness and ease of control. Also, now your rolling gun acts as a shield that can cancel out bullets that it comes into contact with, and you have a powerful new buster shot that in addition to dealing some serious damage, also clears away any bullets that it touches which is extremely useful when the screen starts to fill up with an absurd amount. You no longer have any super bombs in Overpower, which is kind of a bummer. I myself am a big fan of explosions, but it's made up for by giving you a shield meter that allows you to absorb multiple hits before losing a ship, and you can collect power-ups to replenish your shield, as well as an additional power-up that increases your maximum shield, allowing you to absorb more hits, and you still get the power meter system from the original game that grants you some extreme firepower and a whole hell of a lot of bonus points. So in terms of gameplay, Overpower, I feel, plays smoother than the original, and the difficulty is better balanced, and overall, it's a much more fun experience. On top of that, there are a number of different gameplay modes to choose from that can make things either much easier on you or much more difficult, and tying it all together is a revamp soundtrack that once again sounds great. Lots of high energy music to really get you into the action. So it's all positives with this game and this collection as a whole. Two variations of one of the best shoot 'em ups to be released in recent years make this a shooter that Switch owners won't want to miss. It's definitely one of the best games in the genre to be released for the console, and that covers a lot of ground. It's Rolling Gunner plus Overpower, and it's oh so awesome. Awesome! Everybody and welcome back for another bullet blood and neon tinged mad panic review and if you love synth wave music cyberpunk imagery and lots of 80s film references in your video games then I have the perfect game for you and that is hunt down this is a 2021 release developed by easy trigger and physical copies were published in Japan by Beep. And while I'm playing the Switch version here, it can also be played 
on the PS4, Xbox One, and Steam. I'll go into detail, but if you're someone who doesn't like to sit through reviews, I'll say right now that this is one of my favorite games I've played in the past few years, and I highly recommend it to anyone that enjoys run-and-gun games or just video games generally. I'm just sorry it took me so long to get around to playing it, so let's take a closer look and see why Hunt Down is so damn awesome. Hunt Down is a game that wears all of its inspirations on its sleeve, and for a big fan of 80s action and sci-fi films like me, it's a big part of what makes this game so enjoyable. It's set in a dystopian future where people either become subservient to the government and corporate entities ruling the world, or they turn to a life of crime. In which case, you can look forward to having your brains splattered on a wall by one of the game's three protagonists. One-liner spouting bounty hunters working for the Shimamoto conglomerate. The story sets the stage for a blood-soaked cyberpunk adventure and each of the game's three playable characters comes with their own unique weaponry and distinct personalities, but they all feel like they just walked out of an action flick. Just to name a few, you'll notice influences from Terminator, Blade Runner, Robocop, Cobra, The Warriors, and a lot more, even including 80s movie posters in the backgrounds of certain stages. Your playable characters also have a bottomless well of one-liners and quips to make use of as you blow criminal scum to bloody bits. You'd think this would get annoying after a while, but it actually remained consistently funny and gives the characters a lot more personality than they otherwise would have had. You are terminated. Let's do it. And in terms of visuals, this is perhaps the best looking game to utilize retro style pixel graphics I've ever seen. Every stage is extremely detailed and a feast for the eyes. Honestly, I had to just stop occasionally and stare at the backgrounds and just appreciate how much time and effort went into making each stage feel alive. It perfectly captures the dystopian cyberpunk aesthetic and going along with that, the soundtrack is amazing. I've become a fan of synthwave music as of late and the music here I would happily listen to on the train ride home at night. It sounds awesome and perfectly matches the look and overall feel of the game. By the numbers, boys. You need to pull yourself together. I've already gushed about this game quite a bit, and I've barely mentioned the most important element, which is of course the gameplay, which is incredibly fun and can offer up a decent challenge as well. The premise is pretty simple, you select one of the three characters that has their own unique handgun with infinite ammo, and a throwing weapon which also has unlimited usage, but you have to wait a bit between each time you use it. The game is split up into four different areas of a Blade Runner-esque city, and each area is controlled by a different gang and features five stages to complete. It's your job to go into these areas, eliminate these gangs with extreme prejudice, and collect bounties, which in this case are the bosses that you'll face at the end of each level. I mentioned that each character comes equipped with a handgun and throwing weapon, but in every level, you'll find a ton of weapons to make use of, including Uzis, rocket launchers, laser guns, melee weapons, C4 explosives. You can even find the old painless chain gun from Predator, which is all kinds of awesome. And as you annihilate your enemies, they usually explode into a bloody mess. You can turn the blood down or off in the options menu if you really want to, but I obviously did no such thing. 
You've just been erased. Uh, that's messy. Take you to the bank, the blood bank. There's a bit of platforming thrown in here and there, but for the most part, this is a pure run and gun, and each stage concludes with a boss fight, and these are really cool. Each boss presents a unique challenge and a unique personality as well, and they can get pretty damn tough, especially the final boss of the game that just might have you pulling your hair out. Also, in each stage, there are a few bonus challenges to complete, such as killing every enemy in the stage and finding hidden suitcases, and in addition to the original story mode, there is also an arcade mode that challenges you to blast your way through each of the game's four areas without saving. You have to complete them in one sitting and rack up your high score, and if you lose all of your lives, you will have to sacrifice a bit of your score to continue. This mode also features way more enemies to take out, more stuff to collect for score bonuses, and rewards you for things like kill streaks and especially stylish kills. It adds a whole new dynamic to a game that was already extremely fun, and this mode might just be my preferred way to play. In short, this game looks amazing, it sounds amazing, and it's one of the best run and guns ever made, in my humble opinion, of course. So again, I say, if you love games with guns, gore, and groovy tunes, you owe it to yourself to play Hunt Down any way you can, because it is awesome. Holy shit! Some mysterious kick! I play a lot of shoot 'em ups. It's one of my favorite genres, and I especially love the simplicity of the gameplay. Just shoot everything while avoiding being shot yourself, which is perfect. But as much as I love shooters, I can admit that a lot of them do sort of run together. There are a lot of Don Maku shooters out there, tons of indie shmups that seek to mirror the gameplay of cave shooters, for example dense fields of bullets, tiny little hitboxes, convoluted scoring systems, cut and paste spaceships, and samey looking anime characters. They're still fun games and I'm very happy to play all of them, but they're usually lacking something in the way of creativity. Then a game like Never Awake comes along and puts a big ol' smile on my face, with its imaginative visuals and addictive gameplay. It might not necessarily be the kind of game that quote unquote hardcore shmup players will go for, but I certainly do love it. So let's take a closer look and see what it is that makes Never Awake such a unique shooter in a sea of new shmups being released on an almost monthly basis. The visuals and setting of Never Awake are probably the things that will grab your attention first. The entire game has a graphic style that looks like something out of a storybook, with monstrous looking characters flying around in very bizarre locations, and everything just has a look that seems like it's sprung from the mind of a child. That's because, as the name implies, Never Awake takes place entirely in the dreams of a little girl named Rim, who has unfortunately suffered some kind of accident and is lying in a hospital bed, unable to wake up. The backstory of Rim is given to us in the form of diary entries after completing stages, and we learn a lot about her, her family, and her personal life, and why her dreams are the way they are. For instance, Rim hates vegetables, and she's afraid of dogs, and she's jealous of the attention her sister gets, and she has a hard time making friends at school. This is all told to us in her diary entries, but even without them, 
it's still pretty obvious that what you're dealing with are Rim's real-world problems, manifest as horrible nightmares. Luckily though, Rim has her true inner self, personified here as a hooded figure with the ability to blast away all of those terrible monsters, or in other words, confronting her fears and anxieties and conquering them. For a shoot 'em up to have a plot much deeper than good guys fight bad guys is pretty rare, but the story of Never Awake and how it's told is actually quite gripping and really does make you want to play to the end of the game and hope for the best outcome for Rim. An interesting story and creative visual style are all well and good, but it wouldn't be much of a shooter without, you know, shooting. And luckily there's plenty of that too, and again it's handled differently than most other shooters out on the market right now. For starters, this is a twin stick shooter, meaning that while your movement is controlled by the left analog stick, the direction that you fire in is controlled by the right analog stick, and I've always really enjoyed this style of gameplay. It just feels very smooth and intuitive for me. The most recent example I can think of is Rolling Gunner Overpower, another shooter that I absolutely loved. So as the screen auto-scrolls either horizontally or sometimes vertically, enemies will appear from all directions, and you simply need to blast them to bits. Defeated enemies then leave behind little bits of soul which you'll need to pick up in order to fill up your soul meter shown at the top of the screen. Once it reaches 100%, the stage is complete, and the stage will loop over and over again, becoming more difficult on each loop until this is accomplished. You have one single primary attack, but you can unlock a whole bunch of powerful special attacks along with other enhancements in the game's shop area, where the souls you collect double as this game's currency. And as you progress through the story, more special attacks and items become available to you. And these include things like homing attacks, a big shotgun blast, super bombs, and items to increase your health or make it easier to collect souls. You start out pretty weak, but as you clear more and more stages, you're eventually very well equipped to deal with the challenges ahead, which again seems kind of allegorical in this case. So the gameplay in Never Awake is very enjoyable. It's intuitive, fluid, it's fun, and it can give you a decent challenge in some spots. On top of that, for a shmup, this game is quite long. It actually took me several hours to complete it versus the 30 minutes or so it usually takes me to clear a shooter. And after you clear the story mode, there are still additional challenges to go back and complete for some cool bonuses. And these challenges can be anything from clearing a stage in a single loop to avoiding souls during a boss fight and instead destroying the boss, which I didn't know you could do until the challenge opened up. So Never Awake is a game that'll keep you playing for a good long while, and keep playing I did. In fact, I'm still playing it. Sure, it's no Dodon Pots or Crimson Clover, but Never Awake offers a unique gameplay experience that is both fun and honestly kind of heartwarming. It's one of the more enjoyable shooters I've played in a while, and in fact, one of the better games in general that I've played recently, and it gets my highest recommendation. It's
Hey everybody, welcome back for another hacking and slashing, slicing and dicing Mad Panic game review where today we are taking a look at a game that is at once a sequel to a Neo Geo side scroller from the late 90s and a game that takes a lot of inspiration from some of the classic ninja action titles of old and that is Gun Ryu 2 on the Nintendo Switch which was developed by Storybird Studio and published by Pixelheart. And after playing Andro Dunos 2, another modern sequel to a Neo Geo game that was also published by Pixelheart, I was excited to play Gun Ryu 2 and find out if it was another home run because I loved Andro Dunos 2. And while I've never played the original Gun Ryu, I'd honestly never even heard of it before playing this game, I am a big fan of the games that Gan Ryu 2 sought to emulate. So let's take a closer look and find out if this is an instant ninja classic or a reeking ninja fart. Silent, but deadly. Long distance hand fart kill. Before I start the review proper, I feel I should mention that when this game was first released, it was apparently plagued with bugs and was lambasted for being unfinished and very laggy, but soon after its release it was patched to fix at least most of those bugs and that's when I finally picked it up. So be aware if you get yourself a copy of Gan Ryu 2, you'll be needing to download the version 1.1.2 patch or be faced with a much worse game than what I played. That being said, I thought the gameplay in Gan Ryu 2 was really good. When I first started playing, it was immediately apparent that the Shinobi series was a huge influence here, but I also picked up hints of Ninja Gaiden and Strider Hiryu. Essentially, it's like a lot of other action platformers get from point A to point B while slashing up enemies and collecting power-ups. But there's some seriously tricky platforming segments here that might have you pulling your hair out. I found it way more difficult than any other aspect of the game. As far as offensive abilities go, you've got quite a lot to make use of. For starters, you have a limited supply of ninja kunai to attack with from long range, and their attack strength can be temporarily greatly increased with a power-up. And for close combat, you have your trusty katana sword that you can rapidly slash with again like a mix of Shinobi and Strider. You also have a dash attack which is very handy not only for getting through enemy defenses, but also for clearing some big gaps and other various bits of platforming that'll have you wall jumping, double jumping, and air dashing your way to death after death after death before you finally get the sequence down. I said it already, but this is easily the most challenging aspect of this game but also the most fun, actually. There were so many tricky jumps and obstacles in some areas that I almost got a bit of a Donkey Kong Country vibe from them, and it was very satisfying when I finally cleared a section that was giving me a lot of trouble. And when you do finally have the stages figured out, it's really fun to blow through them as quickly as possible while annihilating all of the enemies that get in your way. Finally, you have a variety of ninja magic abilities that you can pull off when your spirit gauge is full, and these include a screen clearing super attack, a boost to your attack strength, or the one that I found the most useful, the ability to fully regenerate your health. It takes a while to build up your spirit energy though, and you lose all of it if you die, so it's not something that you can always rely on. And with that are the boss battles, which I honestly thought were the weakest aspect of the game. Some of them can be a little tricky at first, but once you learn their attack patterns, they're almost 
too easy. There are also a few segments thrown in to mix up the gameplay a bit, like a minecart area and a side-scrolling shoot-em-up section, which is fun if a bit basic, but for the vast majority of the game, you'll be hacking and slashing, jumping and dashing, taking out legions of enemies, and discovering areas loaded with point bonuses and power-ups. In terms of presentation, I found Ganryu 2 to be a bit of a mixed bag. There is a story to follow along with, but it's honestly not particularly interesting. There's a bad guy that wants to take over Japan with his hordes of demons, and you're the good guy, named Musashi by the way, and you want to stop the bad guy's evil plan. Not exactly Shakespeare, but perfect for a game like this. There are cutscenes sprinkled throughout the game to move the story along, but they're honestly not very interesting either. The visuals in Ganryu 2 are really nice in spots. Some of the stages featuring really detailed and colorful backgrounds, and overall the art direction in these areas is great, but there are also a lot of caves to run around in which are much less impressive to look at. I like the design of Musashi himself though, you have to respect any ninja warrior who isn't afraid to wear pink. The visuals and weird fashion choices aside though, I did enjoy the music in Ganryu 2. It's a cool mix of traditional Japanese instruments like shamisen, shakuhachi, and taiko drums with kind of a late 90s early 2000s electronic sound that came out really well. If nothing else, it's very fitting to the game and helps to drive the action forward. Ninja. So my final verdict is that Ganryu 2 is a very good action platformer that mixes in a lot of elements from other games to great effect. It's not a perfect game, mind you, it's too difficult in some spots and too easy in others and there is still the occasional glitch to deal with but overall, I really enjoyed this game, and I can recommend it to anyone with a love of the classic ninja action games of old. It's Gun Ryu 2, and it's awesome. They're perfect to prank your family and your friends. Fight ninja. Hey everybody, welcome back for another gunslinging, sidewinding, Mad Panic review where today we are taking a look at a game that flew under my radar for quite a long time until I played some of Natsume's other modern remakes of their SNES games and that's Wild Guns Reloaded on the Nintendo Switch. Full disclosure, before this review I'd actually never played the original Wild Guns. It wasn't a popular title upon its initial release, and by the time I became interested in retro game collecting, it was already a pretty rare and expensive game, but after playing Pocky and Rocky Reshrined and Ninja Saviors, both remakes of 16-bit Natsume games that were great to begin with and becoming more familiar with other Natsume games and just how good they are, I thought it was about time to go back and give this game a try, and I am so glad that I did. So let's take a closer look and see what makes Wild Guns Reloaded such a rootin' tootin' good time. Wild car, bitches! Yeah! Essentially, Wild Guns Reloaded does the same thing that the other Natsume remakes do. It takes the core gameplay of its 16-bit counterpart and expands upon it while also giving the visuals and sound design a big boost. In the original Wild Guns, you had two playable characters to choose from, with two-player co-op available, and it played as basically a big shooting gallery with your characters in the foreground, shooting enemies and objects in the background. It's a gameplay style that was established in games like Cabal, Nam 1975, and The Punisher on the NES, but you could argue that at the time, Wild Guns was the best game yet to implement this gameplay style. It was fun, 
challenging, and the blend of a Wild West setting with futuristic robots and weaponry was something very novel at the time. Throw in some nice visuals and a great soundtrack, and what you have is, to use a cliche, a hidden gem of an SNES game, or at least it was in 1994. Now, as for Wild Guns Reloaded, this game is a perfect example of how to update a 16-bit classic. I said when I reviewed Pocky and Rocky Reshrined that it might be the best modern retro update ever, but that was before I played this game. The core gameplay really hasn't been changed much. You're still blasting away at a legion of enemies, including bandits, outlaws, and giant robots, but this time around you have four playable characters to choose from. Clint and Annie return from the original game, but now we also have the pleasure of playing as Bullets, a small dog that's accompanied by an attack drone, and Doris, a full-figured gal who prefers to toss explosives at her targets. And instead of two-player co-op, we are treated to up to four players at a time, and this makes for some extremely fun and very frantic gameplay. Bullets, bombs, and laser lassos fill the screen as each player tries to destroy as much as possible while dodging a swarm of bullets. And that's not even mentioning the boss battles which have you going head to head with some massive robots wielding some serious firepower. But luckily you have a ton of weapons at your disposal including shotguns, grenade launchers, and laser beams and when all else fails, a little bit of dynamite usually does the trick. So just going on the gameplay alone, Wild Guns Reloaded far surpasses its predecessor in every way possible, but that's not all. The graphics have also gotten an overhaul to give the game a much more detailed look without losing that retro feel, again in the same vein as the other modern Natsume games. It doesn't lose what made Wild Guns an appealing looking game in the first place but the added detail, color, and animations make this one of the better looking modern retro remakes I've ever played. And the cherry on top of this kick-ass cowboy and robot Sunday is the soundtrack, which again was already great in its 16-bit iteration, but in my opinion, the updated version just blows it out of the water. These songs really do sound especially good when you throw some screaming guitars into the mix mashing up speed metal with just a hint of Old West twang. A nice bonus though is that if you prefer the 16-bit sound, both versions are available in the options menu. So when you blend beautiful visuals and an ass-kicking, high-energy soundtrack with some frantic, challenging, and extremely fun gameplay, what you get is an instant classic, and I'm just sorry it took me so long to get around to playing it. It's Wild Guns Reloaded! And it's awesome. Hey everybody, welcome back for another Mad Panic game review, and today we are taking a look at one of the most recent shoot-em-ups to be released for the Nintendo Switch, at least in physical form, and that is Dodonpachi Daifukatsu, aka Dodonpachi Resurrection, which I was actually pretty surprised to see get a physical release, honestly, I've been anticipating 
the M2 port of Dodon Pachi Daiojo. M2 being a developer that has been absolutely crushing it lately with one awesome STG port after another. But when I saw that Livewire, who previously ported some of Cave's other shooters to the Switch, would be releasing their game physically first, I thought I might as well try it out. A little appetizer before getting to Daiojo, but I was instead delivered a three-course meal because this is an awesome port of DDP Resurrection and it is absolutely stuffed with gameplay modes. For starters, we get version 1.5, which is the original arcade version of Daifukatsu. And if you're watching this video and still have somehow never played a Dodon Pachi game, this is basically the quintessential bullet hell shooter. It gives you three different ships to choose from that all have different fire modes and slight differences in speed and handling. And in addition to that, you also have several different ship styles to choose from that alter your ship's firepower and abilities, such as having access to a supply of super bombs and an auto bomb ability, but weaker primary weapon, or being able to access a hyper mode that greatly increases your firepower, but not having any bombs to fall back on. It's quite a bit of variety for a shooter, and it's fun to mix and match, and find the gameplay style that works best for you. There are also options to play around with to alter the game's difficulty, controls, and how many lives you have per credit, but generally speaking, this is a fast-paced, chaotic, and very challenging shooter with a variety of enemy ship types and some absolutely brain-melting boss battles. And on top of that, we're treated to some excellent visuals and a great soundtrack. It's always a concern with ports like this that they may have been ported poorly, featuring excessive input lag, or various graphical and audio imperfections, but that's not the case here. Livewire has done an amazing job with this port, delivering on some responsive gameplay that I was very happy with. Indeed, this is a fantastic port of DDP Resurrection, and that is just one of eight, count them eight, different gameplay modes available in this package. In addition to the original arcade mode, there is also the 1.51 mode, which to me is the least interesting of the various modes included here. The game states that it's a special event only version of the game, and that special event was the Cave Shooting Festival back in 2010. I'm not exactly sure what the differences here are though, to me it plays pretty much the exact same as the regular arcade mode, though I imagine there's some alteration to the scoring system or something like that, but overall, it just feels like plain old DDP Resurrection to me. Next, we have the version B mode, which plays like a caravan mode of sorts. It allows you to not only pick your ship and style, but also whatever stage you want to play in. And essentially, you just do your best to rack up the highest score possible in that one stage, so I guess you can think of it as kind of the score attack mode. It's a lot of fun, but also quite the challenge. After that, we have version L, which I had a lot of fun with. In this mode, you play as the Type A ship from Dodon Pachi Daiojo. This allows you to switch between normal and boost fire modes, activate a hyper mode for maximum firepower and still have an auto bomb to fall back on. So you're absolutely armed to the teeth and your movement speed is rather fast, but it's DDP, so it's still one hell of a challenging mode and it's insanely fun. It's an especially nice deviation if you've been playing the arcade mode for a good long while. 
Finally, for 1.5, we have the Novice Mode, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's just an easier version of the original arcade mode, perfect for newcomers to the genre. It starts out easy enough, and the difficulty gradually increases, but it's a great way to ease into Dodon Pachi before taking on some of the more challenging gameplay modes. And speaking of challenging, next up we have the Black Label Mode. And this is a mode that again plays very much like the arcade original, but there are alterations to things like bullet cancelling as well as how you use your bombs and your hyper mode, but essentially the intention behind Black Label is that it's DDP Resurrection cranked up to 11. It's more difficult, especially if you're playing with the strong style enabled and it features a new supercharged soundtrack and some mild graphical upgrades too. When you've had your fill of version 1.5 and want to kick things up a notch, this is definitely the mode for you. Next up we have another novice mode, this time for Black Label, which is very fortunate because as I said, Black Label does crank up the difficulty and there are some alterations to the gameplay that may take some getting used to. So for those of us that need a little seasoning before we're ready to take on the Black Label brutality, this is a very useful gameplay mode. Last, but certainly not least, we have the Black Label Arranged Mode, which just might be my favorite mode included here because it lets you play through the entire game as the ship from Ketsui, another excellent cave shooter, and one I very much like. So you get the lock-on ability from Ketsui, which deals massive damage and you can collect the green score bonuses that emerge from destroyed enemies and you have access to both super bombs and a hyper mode. And just overall this mode is a lot of fun and something different from the rest of the gameplay modes included here. It's still very challenging, it can definitely kick your ass as it admittedly did mine, but you'll have a great time all along the way. So that's it, one game, eight different gameplay modes, hours of enjoyment, and especially if you're a shooter fan and a lover of bullet hell games specifically, I think this is a must own because it's just so robust and it's been ported very faithfully, so I think it's definitely worth owning. It is currently available digitally both on Steam and the Nintendo eShop, but if you're like me and you prefer to have physical copies of your games, the physical Switch version was published by Super Deluxe Games, which is what I played for this review, and it is definitely well worth owning. It's Dodon Pachi Dai Fukatsu, and it's awesome.
Hey everybody, welcome back for another Mad Panic game review. And today's review is especially cute because we are taking a look at a recently released cute em up for the Nintendo Switch, and that is Trouble Witches Final Episode 1 Daughters of Amalgam. And I said it's a cute em up, but it would be more accurate to say that it's my favorite cute em up. You see, the Trouble Witches series dates back to 2011, when it first appeared in arcades, and was eventually ported to Xbox Live Arcade, where I first played it. Since then, there have been numerous releases in the series, some of which can be found right now on Steam, but this newest entry is, in my opinion, the best one yet. So let's take a closer look and see just what makes Trouble Witches final. Such a fantastic shooter. As you can clearly see, this is a side-scrolling shooter that leans heavily into bullet hell territory. Though as you'll find out, it's a lot more forgiving than most Don Maku games. In fact, this would probably be a good introduction to the genre. It's kind of like Cotton Reboot crossed with Magical Chase, and just a pinch of Akai Katana. You have a lot of different characters to choose from that all have varying stats and are labeled as beginner, intermediate, and advanced depending on their attributes and what kind of shot form they have. But honestly, there's not a huge difference between them. Each character also comes with an assist creature that fires off attacks of its own, but can also generate a magic barrier, which you'll soon learn is your most useful ability. Bullets that enter the magic barrier immediately slow to a crawl, and when you destroy enemies, any bullets they had in your barrier are converted into coins. Actually, all of the enemies you destroy also leave behind coins for you to collect, and it's with these coins that you can buy lots of helpful power-ups at the jack-o'-lantern shop that appears several times in each stage. These power-ups include a myriad of super attacks, increasing your MP gauge, which extends the amount of time you can deploy your magic barrier, and you can even purchase extra health. You have to monitor your spending though, because every time you purchase an item, it will be more expensive the next time it appears in the shop. That's pretty much it as far as gameplay mechanics is concerned. Just pick a witch, blast everything that appears on screen, collect tons of coins, buy power-ups, and do it all over again. It's incredibly fun and addictive, and again, this is one of the more forgiving bullet hell shooters, primarily because of all of the various abilities and power-ups it affords you. So it's easy to get into, and if you want a greater challenge, there is a mode called Valpurgis Knight, which cranks the difficulty way up. In fact, there are quite a lot of gameplay modes to choose from, including a score attack mode, endless mode, practice, arcade, and a story mode. Though the story mode is the exact same thing as the arcade mode, except there are dialogue segments at the beginning and end of each stage and these honestly make little or no sense, and sometimes the dialogue is just downright weird and not very interesting. So I say just stick with the arcade mode or the challenge mode, because the writing clearly wasn't a priority for this game. But that's okay, because when a shooter is as fun as this, it doesn't really need a story anyway. In fact, the one really interesting thing about the story in Trouble Witch's final is that the Leviathan thing from Hellraiser 2 somehow made its way into the game, which freaked me out. In a good way, though. My god. Leviathan, Lord of the Labyrinth. So 
So this game is a lot of fun, that much is evident, but it wouldn't be a cute em up if it wasn't, you know, cute. And this game certainly is. All of the characters are obnoxiously adorable little anime witches accompanied by cute little animals and other various creatures, and the entire game is luminously bright and colorful. It's like a bag of Skittles threw up in here. It really is a very vibrant and appealing game to look at, and going along with that, it also features a very upbeat and energetic soundtrack that you'll be lucky to hear through the constant sounds of explosions and coins being collected. Yes, indeed, from top to bottom, this is one fantastic shooter, and I personally can't wait for episode two, whenever that might be. So if you've got a Switch, and you like a good cute em up I'd say this is definitely the best one currently on the market. It's Trouble Witch's final episode one, Daughter of Amalgam. And it'll tear your console apart. And to think, I hesitate. Hey everybody, welcome back for another Mad Panic game review chock full of spaceships, laser beams, and bullets. It must be a shoot 'em up. And today's game is one of the better shmups I've played in quite a while, and that is Drainus on the Nintendo Switch. And despite what the name might have you think, it will not clear any pesky clogs, but it will keep you entertained. I play a lot of shooters on this channel and in general, and I'm kind of guilty of not being very critical of them despite the fact that I'm, you know, critiquing them. It's just a genre that's kind of difficult to get wrong, or at least it is for me. As long as there's lots of stuff to destroy and the controls aren't horrendous, I'll usually be pretty happy. But despite my typical leniency on shooters, you can trust me when I say that Drainus is exceptional. So let's take a closer look and see what makes it so awesome. The premise of Drainus will sound very familiar to anyone who has ever played a shoot 'em up. You play as a rogue star pilot named Irina, who has stolen an experimental fighter ship from the evil Carlisle Empire and is using it against them in an effort to save her family and her galaxy, so you'll have to take on the whole empire by yourself, as is tradition. The story is given to you bit by bit, both by cutscenes at the start and end of each mission, but also by hidden data tapes in each stage that unlock additional cutscenes. The story is honestly the least important thing of any shooter, but at least here it's pretty fleshed out and the first stage does throw you a fun little curveball. And at least we understand who we're fighting and why we're fighting them. So you're piloting the titular Drainus fighter ship, which has a whole arsenal of cool weapons available to you, but its key ability is its reflector shield. Whenever it's activated, you can absorb most enemy bullets and laser attacks and convert them into energy of your own and then release it as a powerful homing attack. The more energy you absorb, the stronger the attack is but you have to be careful with it as it has a limited energy supply, which can get you into trouble if you over rely on it. And some bullets cannot be absorbed, so you have to keep an eye out for those as well. Aside from the reflector shield, you can unlock a lot of different abilities by collecting energy from destroyed enemies, which you can exchange for things like spread shots, missiles, additional shields, a variety of different super attacks, more energy for your reflector shield, and more health for your ship. Actually, that's probably the most irritating thing about Drainus, or at least it is for me, is that your access to your power-ups is tied to your health. So when you're at max health and all of your power-ups are activated, you're an absolute death machine. But take a few hits and it's kind of like Gradius. You're still in the shit, but now you're ill-equipped to deal with the challenges that lie before you. 
So the difficulty can fluctuate wildly depending on how many power-ups you have active at any one time. In general though, I'd say the difficulty in Drainus is pretty forgiving, for the most part anyway, especially when compared to some of the bullet hell shooters on the market right now. The controls are responsive, the stages are fairly long, and there are a lot of them. This is actually one of the longer shooters I've played recently, along with Never Awake. The boss battles are pretty cool and tend to be rather over the top. There are a ton of unlockables for your ship, and on the whole, this is just a solid, well-made and very fun shooter. On top of all of that, this is also a pretty good-looking game, all things considered. The stages include everything from planet surfaces and battles in outer space to flying through huge space cruisers and other cavernous areas. It's not really anything you haven't seen before, but it ain't half bad. And that's my assessment of the sound design, too. A lot of high-energy electronic music all throughout that is very fitting for a game like this and helps you get into the action, but is also ultimately very forgettable. The most important thing, though, the gameplay, is definitely a cut above a lot of the indie shooters I've played as of late, and I'd gladly play another shooter from this studio. If you're a shmup fan with a Switch, and you haven't played Drainus yet, I'd make it a priority. It's bad for clogs, but good for shooting. And it's awesome. Liquid plumber urgent clear when you need it now. I heard you need it now. I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> I only need seven. Hey everybody, welcome back for another face smashing, ass kicking, class ditching Mad Panic game review. This time with 30% more high school kids than your average beat em up. Because today we're taking a look at River City Girls 2, a 2022 release from Way Forward and published here in Japan by the always awesome Arc System Works. In fact, it was bundled with the original River City Girls, which I had actually never played before, so this was my perfect opportunity to play both games back to back and make comparisons. And that's exactly what I did. So let's take a closer look at River City Girls 2 and find out if it's a worthy sequel to the first game and the long running Kunio Kun series, or are you better off skipping this one and dusting off that old NES for another playthrough of River City Ransom? Which you might want to do anyway, actually, because that game's awesome. For starters, it has to be said that River City Girls 2 is very similar to its predecessor. And that's to be expected, I suppose, but it's so similar that it almost doesn't feel like a full-blown sequel at times, but more of an update. For the most part, you'll be seeing all of these same environments, though the map has been expanded to include some brand new areas, but also a lot of the same characters, these same weapons, shops, and items, and a lot of this game really is just reused assets. That being said, if you really loved the first game, you'll probably like returning to this setting and these characters, but playing both games back to back, it felt like I was still just playing River City Girls with some gameplay updates when I finally moved on to the second game, at least initially anyway. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with the visuals though, they're still great, it's just that, for the most part, it's nothing you haven't seen before. On the other hand, there have been some pretty significant upgrades to the gameplay, and this game is a marked improvement in that regard. You start off with the four playable characters from the previous game, and as you progress, you can unlock two more, and they all have a unique play style, and you can expand their movesets greatly as you level them up earning money to spend on new attacks at dojos, eventually having a huge arsenal at your disposal that you can chain together into some very elaborate combos, quite a lot more than in the first game. 
You can, of course, also purchase a ton of different items at the shops dotted around the map, including healing items, as well as items that can grant you various kinds of stat boosts. One thing I found a little irritating, though, it's difficult to level up all of your characters evenly since you can only play as one at a time if you're not playing multiplayer. It kind of sucks if, in the middle of a game, you want to play as one of the other characters, but now they're too weak to take on the challenges of whatever area you've progressed to. Some other improvements to the gameplay include being able to recruit two helper characters at a time instead of just one, including certain support characters that you can actually just pay to have them help you out. You don't have to beat them into submission as you usually would. And all of your playable characters, support characters, and extra items can all be accessed at the safe houses that you eventually procure in the different areas of the city. And speaking of, the city has been expanded from the previous game. It's now bigger, with more areas to explore, more hidden secrets, and more characters offering side missions, and there is a fast travel system via the bus stops scattered around, but there is still a significant amount of backtracking involved, which does get a bit irritating after a while. Overall, though, the gameplay is really solid and fun, and with so much to do and unlock, this game will keep you playing for quite a while. The last thing I'll talk about is the presentation, which again, graphically, is almost identical to the first game, which is fine, but the story I found to be kind of irrelevant. The Yakuza once again are taking over the city, and it's up to a ragtag group of high school kids to beat them back. That's all well and good, but again, nothing new, and maybe it's just me, but eventually the English voiceover got a little bit grating. I didn't much care for the cartoon network-ish deliveries, and the jokes didn't land for me a good 80% of the time. Guess you two got some moves after all. I don't see how a dancing video game translates into being able to dance in a club, though. <laughs> of course it does. And we can't wait to, uh, cut a rug or whatever. But the Japanese voiceover is also included here, which I found preferable. Also, a note about the soundtrack, it's mostly really good, but a few of the songs were repetitive and annoying. Mostly the songs with vocal tracks, and I could have done without those, but again, other than that, the soundtrack and sound design in general is really good. So as for whether this is a better game than the original or not, I think it definitely is, even if it is very similar in a number of ways. It's very fun, and again, you'll be getting your money's worth because this is a big game with a lot to do, especially... If you pick up the Japanese version from Arc System Works, you'll be getting two games for the price of one. Indeed, if you've played all of the other beat-em-ups out there on the Switch, and you still feel the need to beat the brains out of some punks, hoodlums, and all-around bad eggs, then go out of your way to play River City Girls 2, because it's awesome. Awesome! Hey everybody, and welcome back for another Mad Panic game review, and today we are in for some face smashing and bone cracking, because we are taking a look at the one, the only, Fight and Rage on the Nintendo Switch. And this is a game that anytime I've brought up beat-em-ups and talked about my favorites, inevitably someone would come along and say something to the effect of, you have to play Fight and Rage, it's the best beat-em-up ever made, which I always thought sounded hyperbolic. I mean, I'm something of a beat-em-up connoisseur, I've played a lot of them over the years, and the title of best beat-em-up is highly contentious, but I finally picked up my own physical copy of Fight and Rage, and I have played the absolute hell out of it and I was very impressed to say the least. So let's go in for a closer look 
And beg the question, is this the best beat-em-up ever? So I must admit, when I first started playing Fight and Rage, I really didn't get what all the fervor was about. I was enjoying the game for sure. I found the story of humans fighting for liberation from mutated animal-human hybrid overlords to be entertaining. It's like the really bad ending of TMNT, and I was impressed by the fact that this game was mostly designed and programmed by one person. I was having fun with it, but I was also getting my ass kicked pretty severely. I tried all three of the playable characters, and I found that Norris, the ninja master of the bunch, was my favorite. But for the life of me, I could not clear this game. I was getting countered by boss characters and swarmed by legions of enemies and dying over and over again. So I decided to give the training mode a try, and that's when I started to understand a bit more about why this game is so beloved. The training mode does a great job of introducing you to the many many offensive and defensive abilities you have at your disposal, and these are all the things you'll need to make use of if you want to get the most out of Fight and Rage. You have a standard combo that can be performed by mashing the attack button, of course, but you can also finish this combo by throwing enemies forward or backwards, or you can transition into a special attack or a launch attack and then continue your combo in the air and cap it off with a super attack or start your combo in the air and then land and then go into standing combos and then carry on from there, racking up huge combos and earning big points in the process. If you can keep combos going long enough, your enemies will actually explode into a pile of bones, again earning you bonus points, and that's very important here because your points are converted into coins after you either finish the arcade mode or get a game over, and the coins are what you'll need to unlock the myriad of bonuses Fight and Rage has to offer. There are additional gameplay modes to unlock, additional playable characters, additional costumes and gameplay features, one of the coolest ones being the ability to play with AI-controlled partners. Fight and Rage does feature two and three player co-op, but if you don't have anyone readily available, it is still fun to team up with the other playable characters and watch the mayhem ensue. This is a fast-paced, intense, challenging, and somewhat chaotic beat-em-up, but it is seriously fun, and the gameplay features depth that you'd normally expect from a good 2D fighter, but it's somewhat uncommon for a game like this. Once you start to get the hang of things, you'll be pulling off huge combos and watching enemies exploding in mass, and it is very satisfying. Aside from the gameplay, I will say that despite obviously being a game that was made with limited means, again, mostly developed by a single person, I do really like the visuals in Fight and Rage. There are some stiff animations here and there, but the character designs, the environments, the menus, and various effects, it all looks really good. It does make me wonder how good this game could look if there was a little more money and a few more people involved in its production though, but overall I like the look of it, and you do get a lot of different display options. You can simulate a CRT TV, a CRT monitor with scan lines, or ditch all of that if you prefer a more modern look, and it has to be said that the soundtrack that again was composed and performed by one person is outstanding. There's a mix of musical styles here, but the standout is definitely the guitar-shredding heavy metal tracks. Very fitting for a beat-em-up and very listenable even outside of the game. Mm -hmm. 
So, Fight and Rage features some decent visuals, an amazing soundtrack, and some absolutely outstanding gameplay, but the original question still stands. Is this the best beat-em-up ever made? And that is a tough question for me to answer. I'm a huge fan of games like Streets of Rage 4, Shredder's Revenge, Aliens vs. Predator, Night Slashers, Mutation Nation, the list goes on and on, so I will just say this. I don't know if it's the best ever, but it's definitely one of the best ever. And I know Finn Sitting is kind of lame, but it's a contentious genre filled with lots of absolute classics, and it's not a choice to be made hastily. Maybe I just need a little more time with this one. Regardless, this is a game that I can recommend to anyone who has even a passing interest in beat-em-ups because it is a true hidden gem. It's challenging, it's brutal, and it's insanely fun. It's fight and rage, and it's awesome. 